Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. We'll be reading the first eight verses. Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, come now and open our minds to be fertile soil so that your word can be planted and grow in our hearts in our lives. We thank you for what you're about to do, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea. Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she eventually won't wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for His chosen ones who cry out to Him day and night? Will He keep putting them off? I tell you, He will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on the earth? This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Prayer is one of those important but often elusive practices in the Christian life. And you may be one that finds prayer to be challenging at times. And some of the questions that come to mind that you may ask is, well, I wonder what should I be praying about? And, and is there, how do I pray? When do I pray? How long do I pray? How often do I pray? And etc. And you may at times think, is God even listening to my prayers? Why don't I see them answered? Am I not praying correctly? Then there are times when the church should pray together. How do we do that? How are we as a church to pray as we look to the present and look to the future? And what should we be asking God about the future? For the Christian, prayer is vital. It is one of those major themes of the Bible that we're looking at. Prayer is essential. In fact, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, Jesus didn't say, if you pray. He said, when you pray. Now in the parable today, He says, we always ought to. To pray. We are to be people of prayer. God wants to have this line of communication with us, and prayer is that line. Now, we do tend to maybe get discouraged when we feel they're not being answered or answered in the way that we uh, pray them. And sometimes this can be an obstacle. We want answers and we want them now. It's like when we pray for patience, Lord, give me patience and give it to me now. So what do most of our prayers focus on? I mean, we could run through a list. We've, we've just had a list of different things, relationships, health, and all those. But I would suggest, as we look at the title of the sermon, that our prayers are breakthrough prayers. We're asking God to do something to break through the current situation. Now, I, I, I didn't come up with this phrase, but I read a book a few years ago called Floodgates by Sue Nielsen Kibbe. We read it as part of a district uh, event. And what her premise was is she, it, that we're praying for God to open the floodgates and allow His power and blessing to come through. And, and she used the term breakthrough prayer to deal with that. So how do we pray breakthrough prayers. Well, the key begins, as Jesus said, don't lose heart. 
begins the reason for the parable is for everybody to pray and not lose heart. Now the phrase not lose heart in the original language of the New Testament means not to give in to evil, to turn coward, to lose heart or behave badly. See it's possible when we don't see answers to our prayers as we would like or as soon as we'd like to give up. And then that allows Satan to come in and mess with us. So Jesus says, let's not lose heart. So here's the setting for this parable. Uh, the parable's tied to the previous verses in chapter 17 by the word then. That every other word, the concern was that when would the kingdom be fulfilled? The disciples had asked that. And so Jesus is calling his followers not to lose heart and to keep on praying. Now, no doubt this scenario was typical, and, and as we understand judges today, in fact, as Charlie was talking about, uh, how judges rule on certain matters and, and deal with things, the judge rules between two parties in matters of justice. Now, Jesus describes this judge as one that does not fear God. Now, that's a pretty searing description. We wouldn't want that said of us. And, and he doesn't respect people. And I think we would want judges to be compassionate. Of course, sometimes their compassion can get in the way of, of the law. But either way, this judge in particular is a rascal. So here's this widow that is looking to have justice in her life. See, as a widow, she has no one to stand up for her. And as a woman in that time, especially... So she takes matters into her own hands. She's seeking a breakthrough. And in verses 3 through 5, we learn that she was continually coming to him. Now the word came to him implies a continual coming. She was persistent in seeking justice. In fact, in verse 5, the judge reveals that she's been doing this frequently, maybe every day. But he kept refusing her justice. But one day he had a change of heart. And he's, he's saying, this woman is so persistent, I'm afraid she might do me harm. Because the reading of this in the original language refers to someone getting hit in the eye. She was afraid, he was afraid of getting a black eye from this lady. So she finally gets her justice. She gets her breakthrough because of her persistence. Now, is, is Jesus tying our persistence to our faith? That, that we're to keep going even when our senses tell us to quit. We hang in there in faith that God knows our situations, that He knows our needs, and will act in the right time. I think you're familiar with the term kairos, God's appointed time. Will we have as much faith as this woman to persist until we see God answer our prayers, to see these breakthroughs? Do we come to the throne of grace as boldly as this woman comes to the judge's bench? She persists daily up till the point that she has not seen her request answered yet, and yet she keeps going. Now, this isn't about badgering God until He gives in. But this is a story about the need for all of us to pray in faith whether things go our way or not. We need to be praying whether we get the outcome we seek or not. We need to be praying whether we feel like it or not. We need to be praying whether we believe it changes God or believe it changes us. Because the message of this parable is simply that we need to be praying. Now, the other part of this parable is what it reveals about God. Jesus often gave us a human example and then says, how much more will God? God is the God of how much more. For example, Matthew 7, Or what man is there among you if his son asks for bread that you'll give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish you'll give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, 
how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? See, if this unsavory character, this unsavory judge relents at persistence, then Jesus says, how much more will God? If this unjust judge grants justice, how much more will God grant justice to His people? So Jesus says, therefore, don't lose heart. If a person such as this infamous character as this judge could yield to the pressing continual requests of this poor widow for whom he felt nothing but contempt, how much more will God be ready to grant our prayers? This God who is infinitely good, infinitely merciful, who loves us in the tenderest of ways and gives us the utmost salvation. Now I know what you might be thinking. I've had prayers that didn't get answered. But think about this. I submit every prayer gets answered. Sometimes it's yes. And sometimes it seems like no, but I suggest it's God saying wait. I've got something different and better in mind. Either way, we need to be looking at how God answers our prayers, like the kids listening, learning to listen. See, we can look back in hindsight and see how God did work in every situation. And it was, I would say a lot of us could probably say it was a different way than we thought it would be. And I would probably say it's also ways that were even better. See, breakthrough prayer relies upon our trust and faith in God. We have to ask and trust that God will answer in the way that He sees best. So we give God the need and allow Him to answer in His best way and in His time. Now, of course, our prayers need to line up with God's will. We can find those in the Bible. And, and of course, we always end our prayers in Jesus' name. And, and I guess, you know, that's not just like, a, oh, I better say in Jesus' name. That'll be the good luck charm. But what does that mean to pray in Jesus' name? It means we line up our prayers with Jesus' nature and with what we know about Him. Mark 11, Jesus, answer, Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if you say to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whether you ask for whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you received it and it will be yours. So we have to keep asking and trusting that God will answer in His perfect time. So Jesus asks the question at the end, when I come back, will I find all of you faithfully seeking God? Will I find people holding fast to their faith and continually trusting in God? See, this underscores the concern of Jesus that the disciples not be shaken in their faith and their confidence in Him. I mean, right now with this election, we're scratching our heads. How did we get to this point? How has this happened? I believe it's God saying, folks, look at me. These guys can't do it. Look to me. So where do we fit in? as Pimento United Methodist Church. Will we faithfully seek God no matter what? And God calls us to persistent prayer and trust in Him. We need to get to the end of our human endeavors and our human strength and lean into Jesus. You know, I believe these prayer requests that we bring up, we do it because we know we can't do anything about it. And only God can. And so we're offering that to Him. So, what does God have for us next? What does He want to have us pray for that only He can do? So we come back to this book, Floodgates, and think about breakthrough prayers. And the author gives three different types. Now, they're, they're, they're very similar, but she, she said this. The first one is threshold prayer. Simply and repeatedly presenting the current reality to God and asking God for God to completely use and transform it for God's miraculous use. I believe that's what 
Charlie's been praying for with Spencer and Riker. For God to take a hold of the situation and use it. A, a verse that comes to mind is Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. Immeasurably more. It's like saying more gooder. <laughs> immeasurably more. That's, that's just over and above. God can do that. So we surrender without reservation the present reality plus ourselves, our perspectives, our attitudes about what it is we're praying about so that every part of that can be transformed by God's power. It's willing to be willing. The second one is archer prayer. You know, we think about archers. Gabby's an archer. So she shoots an arrow into a target. It's when a church decides to specifically pray together on behalf of the need or the hope, asking for breakthroughs that are impossible without God's miraculous action, intervention, or direction. And she gave an example of this, a church that she had been working with, uh, she's from Ohio I believe, they, they were in a, in a town and they were kind of landlocked and they were wanting to expand a little bit but there was this one house, there's always that one house that won't sell and it was an, an older lady, wouldn't sell, wanted an outrageous price. And so her daughter said to her one night, well mom you've been talking about breakthrough prayers, maybe this is an instance. And it's like, yeah. So she, she rallies the church leadership and they begin praying because they needed more parking. And this house would have been perfect to get it out and allow for more parking. But then they thought, well maybe God has other ideas. So they took their focus off of that house and just to God and say, God, what do you want to see happen? What's your plan for us next? And they prayed that for, for several weeks. The pastor comes into the church office and, and hits the answering machine and there is a phone call from this woman in this house. See they have tried and tried and she wouldn't budge on the price. She, in fact she I'm not selling. She calls the pastor and says, uh, Pastor, I forget what her name was, this is so and so, Mrs. So and so. And I've been thinking, I'd like to sell my house to the church. And I don't need any more money. I'll sell it for less than what we've been talking about. <laughs> yeah. It was like she called the trustee chair and said, get over there quick. But they had been praying about it. And they shifted their focus from the situation to God. Wow. And, and, and I think, what does that imply for us? You know, we've, you know, and I hate to keep using the new edition, but I think that's kind of our central focus right now is getting this building finished so that God can use it. And to say, God, what do you want to do with this? And, and God, you're going to have to finish it. You're going to have to provide the money, give us favor with suppliers, or something because we can't do it. See we get to the end of ourselves because if, if people see something, well yeah Pimento, they're, they're loaded with rich people to go there, sure they could, they could just take care of that. Yeah you were all like, yeah boy. Uh, but when they go, well that's not a very big church and they're just modest people like the rest of us and look at what they did. Look at what God did. See the focus then comes away from us to God. When people see God doing things that only God can do, they get their focus off of us and they go, maybe God can do that in my life. Then there's prevailing prayer and, and she, she says sometimes it's called crash helmet prayer. Where we invite God to work comprehensively through us in ways far bigger than ourselves for world-changing impact without limits. 
And, and again, some of these kind of cross over. Because again, if, if people see us doing things that make sense that, well, yeah, they're, they have the ability, they have the money, they, whatever. But if they go, how did they do that? How did that little church do this? How? So the church collectively prays together. And again, I think a lot of these, these three prayers to me overlap. And I think the common thing is we're asking God to do something only God can do to see a breakthrough. Now that can be collectively as our church or individually as we're bringing up some of these concerns about people. We want to see breakthroughs. So let us commit to praying for the next two months to the end of the year. Here we are the beginning of November, so we've got two months for the end of the year to pray for God to move in our lives. Now it may be something in your life that you want to just really ramp up the prayers to persistent prayers. And maybe you want to gather us together and say, hey, and, and we, we're doing that with, with our prayer concerns. Hey, would you commit to pray with me for the next couple of months in this situation or that? We can ask God to do something mighty. Completion of this edition. Whatever it is. What, what, what might it be? I mean this is a tough time to, to invite people to church with restrictions and masks and all that kind of stuff. But it will not be this way forever. We need to be getting to know people. Getting to have relationships with people. That's the wonderful thing about the community dinner. It's a way to build relationships. We know God will be faithful and He promises to do what is right. And so God asks us to trust Him. And be fully open to what He has for us next. It may be totally another direction. God wants to get us in a right position, in right relationship with Him. This means we need to examine our motives in prayer, make sure we're asking within His will, repent of sin in our lives, and that leads us to communion. Things have been different, haven't they? I mean, we're, we're looking at pre-packaged communion sets. <laughs> we're looking at masks. We're looking at blue tape in our pews. Things are different. And for about 1,400 years, the Passover liturgy had not been changed. From the time Moses, it was, it was solid. You knew exactly what was going to be asked, what was going to be said, what types of things you had in this. And then there was that night in this upper room that Jesus changed everything. And all of a sudden... The Passover meal was now different. So may we see in the difference in our, the way we worship, the way we do church, that God is up to something. And so He calls us to remember those things. Do this in remembrance of me, He says. So if you take the insert in your bulletin, and we'll go through the communion celebration liturgy. And I will ask you to read all the bold print. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our heart by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to His table all who love Him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved You with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done Your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. 
Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray in silence. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so, with your people on earth, and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so we remember that on the night that he gave himself up for us, he took bread gave thanks to you, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over he took the cup, gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you, this is the, my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ and that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by His blood. So by Your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at His heavenly banquet. Through Your Son Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit in Your holy church, all honor and glory is Yours, Father Almighty, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And so as we take these, uh, we peel off the top layer carefully. This is the easy part. <laughs> this is the body of Christ given for you. Then we peel back the next layer. It's kind of like peeling back the layers of God as He reveals Himself to us. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray the final prayer together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So may we now go from this place confident in the love of God, confident in the power of God, confident in the grace of God.
that we will see breakthroughs because God is powerful and faithful. Go in peace. Amen.